So major functions of the urinary system will include excretion of organic waste, such as urea from the body fluids, elimination of these wastes into the external environment, <clears throat> and then homeostatic regulation of volume and solute concentrations. The organs of the urinary system will include the kidneys, which are the organs that will actually produce the urine, the ureter, which will transport the urine towards the urinary bladder, the urinary bladder, which acts as a temporary storage unit for urine before urination, and then your, the urethra, which will conduct urine to the exterior uh, in males, it also helps in the transport in, of semen. So the organs of the urinary system, you have two kidneys, which will produce urine that flows throughout the urinary tract. The urinary tract will include the two ureters that transport urine from the kidneys to the bladder. We'll also include the bladder, which stores the urine until elimination from the body. And then the urethra, which will transport urine from the urinary bladder to the exterior of the body. Elimination of urine is a process that is called urination or micturition. In addition to removing organic waste, the urinary system also regulates blood volume and blood pressure, regulates the concentration of plasma ions, such as sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium, it helps to stabilize blood pH, and it conserves valuable nutrients like glucose and amino acids. The location of the kidneys is located on either side of the vertebral column between the last thoracic and third lumbar vertebrae. So upper lower back. The right kidney does slit, sit slightly lower than the left kidney. It's displaced somewhat by the liver. It is situated behind but dorsal to the peritoneum. This position of being outside of the peritoneum is referred to as retroperitoneal. You also have uh, adrenal glands, which we talked about in the endocrine system, which are located on the superior surface of each kidney. And here you can see the overall position of the kidneys. Again, that uh, right kidney, I'm sorry, the left kidney is gonna be a little bit higher than the right kidney there. So the kidneys are held in place by overlying peritoneum. Uh, it's in contact with adjacent organs, uh, and it also has a supportive connective tissue. The supportive connective tissue forms what we call a fibrous capsule that covers each kidney. The capsule surround, is surrounded by adipose tissue and the outer fibrous layer anchors to surrounding structures. Damage to the suspensory fibers of the outer layer may result in displaced or floating kidney. The kidneys are bean-shaped organs. They're about 10 centimeters long, about five and a half centimeters wide and about three centimeters thick. So they're not really that huge. Um, you do have an indentation on one side, which is referred to as the hilum. <clears throat> the hilum is the point of entry for the renal artery and the renal nerves. It's also the point of exit for the renal veins and the ureters. Uh, the fibrous capsule, this is the connective tissue covering that will cover the outer surface of the kidney. And here you can see the general structure of the kidney. You can see a general cross section here. And you can essentially see how you have these uh, uh, segments that are all going to filter into uh, what we call the renal pelvis here, which will eventually drain into the ureter. So the renal cortex, this is the outer layer. Uh, it is in contact with the fibrous capsule and parts of the cortex move inwards towards the medulla, referred to as the renal columns. So this is the cortex here. Okay, these would be those renal columns right here. The renal medulla is the inner layer, contains six to 18 cone-shaped renal pyramids. The tip of each renal pyramid is called the renal papilla and it projects into the minor calyxes. A kidney lobe will contain a renal pyramid, overlying cortex and the renal columns. So urine production actually begins in the functional unit of the kidney, which is called nephron. And the nephrons are in the cortex of each kidney lobe. There are about 1.25 million nephrons located in each kidney. Ducts within the renal papilla will drain urine into a cup-like structure called a minor calyx. The four to five minor calyxes will merge to form the major calyx. The two to three major calyxes will combine to form a large funnel-shaped chamber called the renal pelvis. 
and the renal pelvis will empty out into the ureter. And you can see those structures here. <clears throat> uh, blood supply to the kidneys. The kidneys do receive about 20 to 25% of the total cardiac output or about 1200 mils of blood each minute. Blood from the paratubule capillaries follows two possible paths. In the cortical nephrons, which are located almost entirely within the cortex, the outer region, blood flows from the paratubule capillaries directly into the uh, cortical radiate veins. In the duction medullary nephrons, the paratubule capillaries are connected to the vasorecta, which runs parallel to the long nephron loops of the ones that are located in the medulla. Blood flows from the vasorecta into the cortical radiate veins. So let's talk about the nephron, the basic functional unit of the kidney. consists of two main parts, the renal corpuscle and the renal tubule. So here we have our nephron, okay? Uh, and we can see the renal corpuscle here. And then we have our tubule system, which will include the PCT, proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron loop, or loop of Henle, and then the DCT, which is a distal convoluted tubule. So in the renal corpuscle, this is where you're gonna produce filtrate, the fluid that actually enters into this nephron from the blood. In the PCT, you're gonna get reabsorption of water, ions, and all organic nutrients. In the nephron loop, you'll get further reabsorption of water and reabsorption of sodium and chloride. And then finally, in the DCT, the last segment of the, these loops, uh, you'll get secretion of ions, acids, drugs, and toxins, and then variable reabsorption of water, sodium, and calcium ions based on hormonal control. And then you have your collecting system here. So the renal corpuscle, this is where blood supply contacts the nephron. It is a spherical structure consisting of a cup-shaped glomerular capsule containing a network of capillaries called the glomerulus. Blood flows into the glomerulus from the afferent arterial and leaves by the afferent arterial towards the paratubule capillaries. Fluid and dissolved solids are forced out of the glomerular capillaries and into the surrounding capsular space. This process is called filtration and it produces a solution called filtrate. The filtrate flows into segments of the renal tubule in the order of the PCT, the loop of Henle, and then the DCT. Filtrate, filtrate at the end of the tube at the end is called tubular fluid. Each nephron will empty into a collecting duct, beginning the collecting system. The collecting ducts will drain into the papillary ducts, which will drain into the minor calyxes, which will then drain into the major calyxes. But at this point, this is now referred to as urine. <coughs> <coughs> so the renal corpuscle will produce filtrate by a passive process. The filtrate includes valuable nutrients, ions, and water. Many important solids that need to be conserved in the body leave the blood. The tubules will then reabsorb those useful molecules back into the blood. Um, it reabsorbs about 90% of the water also back into the blood and it secretes any waste products missed by the filtration process. And here's the renal corpuscle. So we have an afferent arterial where blood comes in. Due to pressure differences, fluid will actually leave through the capillary bed here and get picked up by the Bowman's capsule, and then it will travel into the PCT, which is the first part of the tubule system. So the glomerulus, this is endothelial cells, essentially a capillary bed composing wall that have pores or called fenestrations. So it's a capillary bed that's pretty porous. The glomerular capsule forms the outer wall of the renal corpuscle. It encloses the glomerulus, and it's formed by two layers of cells separated by a capsular space. The outer layer of the capsular epithelium forms the wall of the corpuscle. The inner layer of the visceral epithelium encloses the glomerular capillaries. Cells in this layer are called podocytes. They have foot processes called pedicles that wrap around the capillaries creating slits for filtration. This filtration membrane uh, filtration is the process that requires solids to pass through three levels of structures. First, the pores of the endothelial cells of the glomerular capillaries. Then second, the fibers of the basement membrane of the endothelial cells of the glomerular capillaries. 
and then third, the filtration slits between the podocytes. These three structures are collectively referred to as the filtration membrane. Combination of structures prevents the passage of blood cells and most plasma proteins into the filtrate. You really shouldn't have blood cells or protein in your urine. Smaller molecules and solids that, have, that are filtered out may be reabsorbed further along the tubule as well. So the first segment is the proximal convoluted tubule. May, majority of reabsorption occurs here. Cells lining the PCT reabsorb organic nutrients, plasma proteins, and ions from tubular fluid. Substances are moved from the tubule to the interstitial fluid or the paratubule fluid. Materials will re-enter the blood and water flows by osmosis, reducing the volume of the tubular fluid. The nephron loop, which is composed of a descending and ascending loop, fluid, will, fluid in the descending limb flows towards the renal pelvis. Epithelium is permeable to water, but not solids. So the only thing that's gonna move is water. The tubule then makes a 180 degree turn in the medulla and fluid in the ascending limb will flow back towards the renal cortex. In this case, the epithelium is not permeable to water. However, it does actively transport sodium and chloride out of the tubule. This results in very high solute concentration in the paratubule fluid of the renal medulla. Water from the descending limb then moves out by osmosis. During the distal convoluted tubule, this is the last segment of the renal tubule. It passes close, close to the afferent and efferent arterioles. And the distal convoluted tubule serves three vital processes. One, active secretion of ions, acids, drugs, and toxins from the blood into the tubular fluid, ending up in urine. The selective reabsorption of sodium from the paratubule fluid back into the blood and the selective reabsorption of fluid, I'm sorry, of water from the tubule fluid back into the blood. We also have a little bit of a regulatory area referred to as the juxta glomerular complex. It's located right here and it consists of two main types of cells, the macula densa cells uh, these are regions clustered closest in the DCT to the glomerulus. And the juxtaglomerular cells, these are smooth muscles. What these cells do is they actually will pick up blood volume and blood pressure. Um, and they can help to regulate uh, blood volume and blood pressure. Remember, if you regulate volume, you can alter pressure. So one way to get pressure up is to retain fluids. If you retain fluids, that increases the volume, which will increase the pressure. If blood pressure is too high, you can decrease the volume by putting more water out through urine, which will decrease the pressure. So the collecting system, uh, many distal convoluted tubules will empty into one collecting duct. Several collecting ducts will merge to form the papillary duct. The papillary duct will empty into the minor calyx. The functions of the collecting system is to transport tubular fluid from the nephron to the renal pelvis. It will adjust final fluid composition, hence urine output. And it determines the final osmotic concentration of urine. It also determines the final volume of urine. Um, so here, this just sort of summarizes, this table summarizes the major structures of the nephron and the collecting system of the kidneys and their functions. So this is a great table because it really just gives you the nuts and bolts of what each of these structures is responsible for. <clears throat> so what metabolic wastes are found in urine? Um, metabolic waste must be excreted to maintain homeostasis. Eliminated, dissolved in urine, which requires water loss as well. Urea is the most abundant organic waste. It's formed from the breakdown of amino acids. Creatinine, this is generated in skeletal muscle tissue from the breakdown of creatinine phosphate. Uric acid, this is formed from the breakdown and recycling of RNA. So those are the waste products that we want to get rid of. The nephrons are responsible for three processes. The kidneys rely on three physiological processes. The first is filtration. Filtration occurs exclusively in the renal corpuscle. Blood pressure forces water through the filtration membrane. Based on the size of the solids, 
solid molecules small enough to fit are carried through the membrane by the water molecules. So again, in filtration, blood pressure forces water and solids across the membrane, the glomerular capillaries, and into the capsular space. Solid molecules small enough to pass through the filtration membrane are carried by the surrounding water molecules. During reabsorption, this occurs primarily in the PCT, is a selective process involving carrier proteins, movement of water and solutes from the tubular fluid back into the paratubular fluid. And with reabsorption, this is again the removal of water and solutes from the tubular fluid and their movement across the tubular epithelium and back into essentially the blood. The third process is secretion. This occurs primarily in the DCT. It transports solids from the paratubular fluid into the tubular fluid and allows the excretion of substances missed by filtration. This is where you get the regulation of water, sodium, potassium in urine, and it results from the nephron loop and the collecting system interactions. The renal processes will produce fluid, urine, very different from the composition that we find in plasma. So again, to summarize uh, the events of the PCT, 60 to 70% of filtrate volume is reabsorbed at the PCT. All glucose, amino acids, and other organic nutrients are reabsorbed here. Osmotic pressure pulls the water out of the tubule by osmosis, determined by solute movement. Active reabsorption of ions such as sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, bicarbonate, phosphate, and sulfates as well. During the nephron loop, we have uh, filtrate entering the loop already has water and many solids removed. The nephron loop removes more than half of the remaining water and about 66% of the remaining sodium and chloride ions. The descending loop is permeable to water only. The ascending loop actively pumps sodium and potassium ions into the interstitial fluid. It is also impermeable to water. It creates concentration gradient in the medulla. This results in highly concentrated waste products at the end of the loop. In the DCT, 80% of water and 85% of solids have already been reabsorbed. This is where you'll see final adjustments made in fluid composition and concentration by active secretion. Active secretion meaning it's under the influence of most likely a hormone. So one hormone that plays a very important role is ADH or antidiuretic hormone. In the absence of ADH, the DCT and the collecting duct are impermeable to water. Therefore, water gets removed from the body and this results in dilute urine. However, if ADH is secreted, the DCT and the collecting duct are permeable to water. Permeable means allows it to move through. More water is reabsorbed, so less is excreted and this serves to produce concentrated urine. Dehydration promotes ADH production. Um, this is just a table that kind of goes over some of the normal characteristics of urine. And once we have formed urine, uh, you have the ureters, which are paired muscular tubes that will conduct urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. Each ureter begins at a funnel-shaped renal pelvis. It ends at the posterior bladder wall and slit-like ureteral openings prevent urine backflow. The ureter wall contains three layers, the inner layer of transitional epithelium, middle layer of smooth muscle that moves urine through the tube by peristalsis, and an outer connective tissue layer, which is continuing with the capsule. Kidney stones, which are also called calculi, these are solid substances made of calcium deposits, magnesium salts, and or crystals of uric acid. They can form within the kidney, kidney, ureter, and urinary bladder. This results in painful condition called nephrolithiasis. It will obstruct flow of urine and it may reduce or prevent filtration. Okay. So the urinary bladder, this is a hollow muscular organ that stores urine. Uh, the size varies with the amount of distension. When full, it can contain up to a liter of urine. In males, the base lies between the rectum and the pubic symphysis. In females, it sits inferior to the uterus and anterior to the vaginal tract. 
<clears throat> the base has a triangular area called a trigon, which is formed by the two ureteral openings in the urethral entrance. The area surrounding the urethral entrance is the neck of the bladder, and it contains involuntary internal urethral sphincter, which is composed of smooth muscle. You do not have conscious control of this particular muscle. The bladder will also contain transitional epithelium and layers of smooth muscle called the detrusor muscle. Contraction of the muscle expels contents into the urethra. So the urethra, this extends from the neck of the urinary bladder to the exterior of the body. You have the external urethral sphincter. This is a circular band of skeletal muscle that surrounds the urethra as it passes through the muscular floor of the pelvic cavity. This is the one you have voluntary control over and this is what you can use to control uh, the output of urine. Uh, in males, the urethra is about seven to eight inches long, uh, and in females, it's about uh, one inch long. Urination is micturition. Increased urine volume will stimulate stretch receptors in the bladder wall. Sensory fibers carry impulses to the sacral region of the spinal cord. The parasympathetic motor neurons will carry information back to the detrusor muscle and to the internal urethral sphincter. Interneurons will relay information to the CNS. Contraction of the detrusor muscle will increase pressure. And then you get the voluntary relaxation of the external sphincter, which allows the relaxation of the internal sphincter as well, and urination occurs. Increased urine volume causes increased stimulation of the parasympathetic nerve fibers, which will increase the muscle contractions of the detrusia, increasing pressure of uh, the fluid. A urine volume that is greater than 500 mils may generate enough pressure to force open the internal sphincter the external sphincter will relax as well and urination will occur. Problems in voiding or retaining urine are often associated with sphincter problems. Some age-related changes with the urinary system. You have a decrease in the number of functional nephrons that drops between 30 to 40% between the ages of 25 and 85. A reduction in GFR. This results in fewer glomeruli, cumulative damage to the filtration structure and reduced renal blood flow. You also get reduced sensitivity to ADH and aldosterone, and you can have problems with urination. You can also have a gradual decrease in the total body water content, meaning that you are much more predisposed to dehydration, a net loss of body mineral content, and an increase in the incidence of disorders affecting major symptoms, which could affect input, in fact, which could impact fluids electrolytes and pH balances. Finally, the urinary system excretes waste produ produced by other organ systems, yet not the only system that's involved in the excretion. A combination of multiple systems sort of regarding an excretory system. The integumentary, integumentary system, you get excretion through perspiration or sweat. The respiratory system removes CO2 and water when you exhale. And the digestive system will uh, you get excretion of metabolic waste products and bile, but also the large intestines will eliminate a lot of waste products by feces. Okay, and that is it. <clears throat>